members' question time. Questions first of all to the Minister of Enterprise, Trade and Investment. And we will start with 15 minutes of topical questions. And I call Danny Kinahan. Thank Kinahan. you very much, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Minister, we've had a, a wonderful and successful our time in our place, and enormously successful Titanic, UK City of Culture, and many, many other things um, with the great work of Howard Hastings. But what's the next step? What's the next plan? I thank the member for his question, and he is right to mention the success of our time, our place, which of course was just in relation to 2012. The idea behind it was to give us a platform really to uh, really have a game changer in respect of our tourism industry. We have continued up this year with the World Peace and Fire Games, the UK City of Culture, and then of course uh, the G8, which came to us off the back of the Prime Minister's decision. Uh, to hold that event uh, in County Fermanagh. Next year, uh, we have the Giro d'Italia coming, and we are very much looking at how events can really make a change uh, to the tourism uh, product here, as well as, of course, investing in our infrastructure. So it's about investing in the infrastructure, but then also bringing events in uh, to Northern Ireland, and we're continuing to work on that strategy. Mr Kinahan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her answer. I wonder if we could look at our time, our place, our people, and look at a future having a Hall of Fame, as I think we could all list many people, Tony McCoy we've already spoken of today, Mary Peters, the Northern Ireland football team under Billy Bingham, Joey Dunlop, we could go on. But could we look at having a, an Olympic-style museum or a Hall of Fame that actually shows the very best of everything that's in Northern Ireland and actually put the funds towards it and make that one of our top priorities in the future? I thank the member for that comment. Of course, this has been raised with me uh, on a number of occasions, uh, uh, most notably by Dame Mary Peters, who is a great supporter of this idea, and indeed uh, Ronnie Spence, the outgoing chair of the Heritage uh, Lottery Fund as well. I'm certainly someone who would be supportive of that idea. I suppose the um, critical issue in it is not just setting it up, but making it sustainable into the future. Uh, and therefore, it's not just a matter for me, as the member will understand, but a, member prob a matter probably for a number of departments right across government. Uh, if the member wishes to come and speak to me about the matter, I'm quite happy to do so. Uh, as I say, it is good to celebrate our people here in Northern Ireland, very much so, because that inspires young people uh, from a different generation, and that's what we're all about. Alec Maskey. Mr. Maskey. Could I ask the Minister, the Minister is aware of uh, the proposed flag leader protest in Belfast City Centre in the run-up to Christmas. Can the Minister give us her assessment of uh, such protests on the uh, local city centre economy? I thank the member for his question. There have been uh, a number of reports uh, recently in relation to the impact it has had on the city centre in particular. Uh, I received one recently and I am still uh, assessing that. Um, I have to say, though, that they just interviewed 30 firms in Belfast, so I suppose we have to look at the, uh, the underlying statistical robustness of the, the, the figures that come uh, to us. But notwithstanding that, uh, I think we have to recognise uh, that protests of any nature in the city centre will have an impact on trade, particularly if it's in and around the peak shopping times. Uh, and therefore, I will renew my call, which I made I think the last time I was on my feet in this House uh, during question time, that there needs to be dialogue uh, between those planning any protests and the people who are most directly affected, i.e. the traders. Uh, Mr. Maskey. Uh, can I thank the Minister for that reply? I am um, well, well aware and appreciate her previous comments on that. But in light of that, could I ask the Minister, has she managed herself to have any uh, contact with any of the organized, protest organisers, more particularly the retailers themselves, actually, to discuss the matter? Well, of course, I've uh, been speaking to the retailers right throughout uh, the original uh, protest time. Indeed, he will recognise that it was my department, along uh, with OFM uh, DFM, who took the lead in the Backing Belfast campaign, which was hugely successful, I have to say, and, and very much appreciated uh, by uh, not only the traders, uh, but the restaurant owners uh, and bar owners uh, in Belfast. And I am, my door is open. Uh, I would very much uh, like to be of assistance and be a facilitating uh, uh, um, person, if I can, as well, uh, in relation to anything that is planned for the winter months, because we do want to see Belfast uh, reaching its potential over the winter months, and uh, certainly if there is anything I can do to assist that, I will, of course, make myself available. 
Jill Barton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I ask the Minister what is her department doing to make the energy regulator be more effective in meeting the interests of electricity consumers? Utility regulator. Sorry, um, the utility regulator, uh, as you know, uh, there's just been a change in personnel there, uh, and indeed we very much uh, wish uh, the outgoing utility regulator well, uh, and welcome the new utility regulator, Mrs Jenny Piper, to her position. Uh, I look forward to having an engagement with Mrs Piper in the very near future uh, in relation to her role uh, and how she sees it moving forward, but as the member will know, uh, the role of the utility regulator is an independent one, uh, and, may, and, and I may express opinions. Uh, it is up to the utility regulator as to whether she, on this occasion, takes them into account. Joe Bird. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answer. Would the Minister agree, however, that there is a gross imbalance when somebody is looking for a new supply of electricity? I know someone who has built a new house, has been quoted 16,500 for a connection charge, and they live within 90 metres of an adjacent house. What can be done through this House to make sure that, that abuse of power is not manifested in the future? Well, can I say to the member that if he uh, looks at the initial findings, and they are initial findings in respect of the price determination, the RP5 price determination that came out uh, on Friday, uh, where the regulator gave a determination that was not accepted by NIE and it went to the Competition Commission, uh, and there have been uh, very important uh, rulings made by the Competition Commission in relation to how NIE deals with not just its price controls, but also how it invests in its infrastructure. Uh, and I've often said to this House that it's, when you look at uh, limiting the price in relation to energy, then there's a consequence for that. And the consequence uh, really uh, is in and around the commerciality of NIE and how they work into the future. And I, I do recognise uh, what the member is talking about because uh, being a, a, an MLA from the west of the country, I too have had constituents coming to me and telling me they have been asked for hundreds of thousands of pounds uh, to connect to the grid. Uh, but it is all connected in, uh, in relation to how much money NIE can uh, actually uh, invest in the grid and how they are allowed to do that because they are regulated. Uh, by the utility regulator. And if the member uh, wants me to mention this to the regulator, I certainly will when I get the opportunity to meet with her. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would ask the Minister if you could let us have an update on Invest Northern Ireland's plans for the regeneration of the Springfield Road, Woodville area of Belfast. Well, as far as I understand, the, nego the negotiations are ongoing in relation to that site. I understand the City Council have also an interest in that site as well. Uh, they were looking uh, at uh, different plans for that area, so they're still uh, in talks about what's the best way to develop that site. Leslie Creed. I uh, thank the Minister for that. I wonder, Minister, following on, could you provide any details of how Invest Northern Ireland, uh, the Belfast City Council and indeed the Metropolitan College plan to cooperate uh, on developing the innovation incubation unit in that area? Well, I know that uh, Belfast Metropolitan College are doing some excellent work uh, up in West Belfast. Indeed, I had the chance to uh, visit the work that they're doing in and around renewable energy and the way in which they are hoping to retrain uh, people perhaps from the construction industry who are finding it difficult to find work they're retraining them uh, into the renewable energy sector. I don't have the details in relation to how those three organisations are working together in front of me, but I'm very happy uh, to provide the member with written information uh, and place a copy in the library. Mickey Brady. Mr. Brady. Gorham, I got uh, Concordia. Uh, can I ask the Minister for her reaction to the reports published by the Ulster Bank and Intertrade Ireland indicating further positive news in the economy? Gorham, I got well, I very much welcome uh, both of those reports today. Um, uh, it again uh, shows that we are stabilising the economy here and moving uh, into growth mode, um, particularly encouraging that growth was seen not just in specific sectors but right across all the different sectors, including retail, services, construction and manufacturing. Also pleasing, uh, Mr Speaker, to note that employment has expanded strongly as well and indeed is at its fastest rate, according to the Ulster Bank PMI survey, uh, for uh, six years. So that is indeed to be welcomed uh, and we look forward to seeing a continued growth in the right direction. Mickey Brady. 
I thank the Minister for her answer. And would the Minister accept that the so-called green shoots of recovery are not evident in every sector, in every location across the north, and how does she plan to address that? Well, as I said in uh, answer to the first um, question, the PMI report actually for the first time are saying that they are seeing growth across uh, all of the main sectors. So I do very much welcome that because until now uh, we have been talking about growth uh, in the agri-food sector, for example, which has always been a very strong uh, sector first in Northern Ireland, and then indeed in the construction and retail we have been seeing huge difficulties. And I am not suggesting that we are back to where we were um, pre-2008. I'm not suggesting that at all. But I think we are seeing a stabilisation uh, in relation to some of those sectors. In other words, I think they've bottomed out. Uh, and because of that, I think we are seeing growth coming around in those sectors for the very first time. Barry McElduff. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her active interest in OMA Enterprise Company uh, recently and, and generally? Uh, and can I ask the Minister what financial or other support arrangements are in place generally for start-up businesses at this time? Well, the, uh, of course, start-up uh, start business uh, advice and assistance that people gain from uh, Invest Northern Ireland, you remember the Regional Development Programme was in some difficulty last year. I'm very pleased to say that that has now rolled out very effectively across Northern Ireland and indeed his own constituency is one of the stronger constituencies in terms of start-up businesses. Uh, as well as that, I'm, I am very pleased to see that start-up loans are now being made available. They were being made available in England and Wales, but they are now being made available uh, in Northern Ireland as well. I very much welcome that. Um, that was part of the economic pact and something we discussed with uh, the business secretary when he came to Northern Ireland about a month ago. So pleased to see that that is now in place as well. And it is about having companies like uh, OMA Enterprise. Uh, to really engender uh, an ecosystem uh, for new companies so that they can uh, a a approach people like Nick O'Shiel uh, for help and assistance and he can then signpost them to the appropriate place. So I am a big supporter of Omer Enterprise. I think they are doing a tremendous job with the facilities that they have uh, and I will always be pleased to visit there again. Mr. Michael Duff. Thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, the Minister will know that OMA Enterprise Centre recently has developed, I think, a, a further 31 additional units there. How might her department work with local business community in OMA to help fill these units and further develop entrepreneurship? Well, one of the exciting things about OMA Enterprise Centre, of course, is the fact that it has direct access into Project Kelvin. I think that's a tremendously strong selling point and one of the reasons why uh, OMA Enterprise, through uh, Nick O'Shiel, uh, is working uh, with Fermanagh uh, in the person of Mark Maguire to develop the smart region uh, philosophy and we are hoping to appoint a data analyst to cover the South West region in the near future and that will inform uh, companies who are seeking to set up what the needs of that area is and I think it is a new and innovative way to looking at start up companies and indeed inward investment. Uh, I know uh, that there have been briefings for the different political parties recently in relation to that and I hope that everybody in the region can get behind that idea because I think it is a new way of looking at investment for the South West region. Trevor Lund. Mr. Lund. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Could I ask the Minister for her assessment of the, the tourism potential of the Narrow Water Bridge project? Well, the Narrow Water Bridge project has always been, uh, a, a, first of all, a, a, a bridge to connect people as opposed to a tourism bridge. It was always secondary uh, in terms of tourism. Uh, so we await hearing uh, whether the bridge. Uh, will proceed, uh, and that, of course, is a matter for colleagues in the executive in DRD and DFP. Trevor Long. I, I, would, I, would, I would query the Minister's assessment that it's, it's purely and not a tourism project, because I think it largely is. Um, but would she agree with me that, given the numbers of people who visit Cooley and Carlingford and the relatively small amount of the cost which is going to fall to the Northern Ireland executive, and, and the amount of money that her department has put into the Mourns area in the last few years. It is actually a very worthwhile project and it should be encouraged from a tourism potential point of view. 
Well, you know, uh, the member can take whatever particular view he wants of the bridge. I am relying on officials' uh, guidance in relation to the financial implications and what the implications will be from a tourism perspective. Uh, and I have to take those on board, as indeed does the DFP minister when he's looking at the financial implications. So we await hearing from the DFP minister and, most importantly, the DRD minister in relation to those issues. Uh, to the Minister, and question number eight has been uh, withdrawn. Sam Gardner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A question number one. Uh, the total number of businesses that became insolvent in the last 12 months, uh, the 1st of October 2012 to the 30th of September 2013, is 866. Uh, this includes both bankrupt businesses and companies. Sam Gardner. Mr. Speaker, I thank the Minister for her question. I thank the Minister for her answer. Will the Minister confirm that despite company insolvencies being down on a year ago, personal bankruptcies are up by 12 per cent and would be worse without debt relief orders? How serious is the personal debt problem and what more can the Minister do to help? I don't have the uh, personal debt uh, figures in front of me. I can tell them um, that companies, company businesses, uh, there have been 417. Um, and uh, Actually, I do. The, fi the bankruptcy are 586, and that's down from 790 uh, from last year. Um, I mean, the, the issue in relation to insolvencies, uh, bankruptcies, and compulsory uh, going into administration and what have you, there is always a lag in the economy in relation to these figures, and indeed it is the same at the start of the recession as well. If you look at the figures for 2008-2009, they were not particularly poor, uh, but once you get into 2011-2012, you can see the impact of the recession really beginning to take hold. And I think as you see the stabilisation of the economy, these figures will uh, continue to go in the right direction. Uh, because if you look at the six-monthly trend for insolvencies, they show a decrease of approximately 10 per cent on the same period last year. But again, there is a lag, so it will take a little while for all of that to work through the system. Mr. McLoan. It's my good question. It's Naira Foster. Uh, thanks very much, Mr. Uh, Speaker, and I thank the, the Minister for her response as well. Um, in relation to the difficulties that have been faced in the local economy, uh, could the Minister advise us uh, the much promised peace dividend? Is that now completely off the table? from the British Government? Uh, well, no. I think that uh, the Member is aware of the economic pact uh, which we are seeing uh, developed. And just last week, uh, I attended uh, a seminar in London with the Secretary of State, uh, jointly hosted by both of us. Uh, and at that event, we hosted 16 regions and countries from around the world where we've seen opportunities. And that was carried out in Lancaster House in London. Uh, so I don't accept that the much vaunted, uh, and to use his words, uh, peace dividend have gone. I think uh, our national government are very much uh, alongside us in trying to sell Northern Ireland as a good place to do business. Uh, if I quote back to you the words of the Prime Minister from October uh, at the investment conference when he said that Northern Ireland was a spectacular place to do business, uh, I think that those are very strong words from the Prime Minister. And of course, we will continue to build on that investment conference. And can I say it was very heartening to see when the First and Deputy First Minister were out in the States. Uh, a very short time ago, another 100 jobs announced for uh, F. G. Wilson, Caterpillar, and we were very pleased that those jobs came uh, and were uh, uh, allotted to Northern Ireland after the investment conference. Uh, those are new jobs in a new area, and I think that's the significant element to it. We are now uh, actually getting jobs in a new uh, area of uh, Caterpillar, and that, that has been carried out through many firms and many sectors. We get a particular sector and then we look to see if there's any other sector in the business where we can help the company to do business better. And that's what we're doing uh, in Northern Ireland. So I think that things are very positive at present and we will continue to push for Northern Ireland as a region to do business in. Paul Frey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I, as the Minister mentions jobs, can I ask her uh, to comment further on the new jobs that have been created over the last 12 months? Well, we're very pleased um, 
that, uh, and indeed encouraged, uh, that our job market has shown signs uh, of improvement, with more than 5,000 added to the local economy over the year to June 2013. Uh, the services sector is a particularly strong sector for us. It has been a key contributor to the growth in jobs, growing by over 6,500 jobs over the year to June 2013. Uh, and as the members in this House will know, we have always put a very strong emphasis on creating uh, jobs, whether that's from foreign direct investment or indeed through the Jobs Fund, which continues to be uh, a very good success uh, for this executive and for, the, for Northern Ireland. Uh, so we're past the targets in relation to the number of jobs promoted uh, in relation uh, to the Jobs Fund, and we are very close uh, to the target in relation to jobs created under the Jobs Fund. As you know, uh, in foreign direct investment, we do not have a target in the programme for government for jobs created. We only have one for jobs promoted. But in terms of the Jobs Fund, we have targets for jobs promoted and jobs created. So I'm very pleased that it looks very likely that we're going to hit both of those in the near future. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. I thank the Minister for uh, her, her uh, answer. Can I ask specifically what support or assistance would be available or that your department can provide for viable firms who are experiencing a temporary cash flow problem to uh, prevent them going out of business? Well, and unfortunately, this has been a particular uh, problem for many companies across Northern Ireland that their banks are calling in uh, debts or reducing their overdraft facilities and they find themselves in problems where they have a very viable business, uh, but they cannot find the working capital uh, to keep going for a period of time when they can get back into the black. There is a, 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 pro a programme called Buying Time Assistance, uh, which Invest and I can uh, come into a firm and try to deal with. Uh, if they find that there is a viable business, they need a specific space of time, uh, and they can come in and have that intervention. Uh, but of course, again, we need the banks to work with us on this, and we need them uh, to listen to Invest NI. And actually, it's very interesting because in Scotland they take the approach where the regional development agency, the government, actually goes into the bank uh, with the company and says, "We believe in this company, uh, and we want you to work with them." And uh, they have said that that can be controversial at times because really you're picking companies to support, if you like, and you're picking sectors. Uh, but they feel strongly enough about it to go into the banks and really sell the proposition to them. So there are particular programmes which Invest and I can put in place, but as well as that, I'm sure colleagues will support companies as they go into banks to try and uh, renegotiate deals as well, and I think that's the most effective thing that we can do as MLAs. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number two. The Joint Ministerial Task Force on Banking and Access to Finance in Northern Ireland met officially for the first time on the 8th of October 2013, chaired by the Secretary of State, the Right Honourable Theresa Villiers MP. The task force is a forum for addressing the challenges faced by Northern Ireland businesses in accessing vital finance. I attended the meeting alongside the Secretary of State, Business Minister Matt Hancock, MP, HM Treasury's Director of Financial Services and, of course, the Northern Ireland Finance Minister, Simon Hamilton. Good progress was made at the meeting with the terms of reference to the task force being agreed and priorities for early engagement discussed. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for her answer? Can the Minister outline the discussions she has had with the Finance Minister to get specific lending data published for Northern Ireland? particularly following the availability of GB information from the British Bankers Association? Well, this is primarily uh, an issue for DFP, but I am, of course, very aware of it, uh, having sat in a number of meetings uh, with the previous Finance Minister and with the now Finance Minister, uh, who never fail to talk about the fact that they are having uh, difficulty uh, sourcing regional data. And indeed, uh, the DFP Minister is still concerned about the lack of detailed regional data. He met with Anthony Brown, the Chief Executive of the British Banking Association, on the 11th of September uh, to discuss how the quarterly SME bank lending data uh, they provide to DFP could be uh, improved. Um, and uh, they have given an undertaking that they will work with the banks to try and develop this data set. But frankly, if I can say to the member, this has been going on for far too long. 
and uh, if we are to make any assessment in relation to the banking system here in Northern Ireland and how they are lending to different sectors, then we need to have uh, the particular data. And of course, we do not have any uh, direct control over the banks here in Northern Ireland, and that is why I very much welcome the Ministerial Task Force, because we are hoping that we can uh, put some pressure on the banks to give us this data, and that is one of the issues I know the Finance Minister is very keen on. Gordon Dunn. Mr. Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for answers here today. How does the Minister view the announcement last week that the Royal Bank of Scotland is to carry out a review into the Ulster Bank? Well, let me say, first of all, I welcome uh, the fact that uh, Ulster Bank will remain a core part uh, of the Royal Bank of Scotland. Uh, both myself and the Finance Minister have been pressing this issue very strongly uh, with uh, the Westminster Government, and we are pleased that they have recognised that this is uh, a big issue for Northern Ireland. Uh, there are aspects of the announcement, particularly those with possible implications for jobs uh, and the local property market, that uh, we need clarification and certainty on, and the Finance Minister is certainly pushing to have that certainty and clarification. And we will continue to engage uh, with uh, the Ulster Bank here uh, and, of course, with the Government on all of these matters uh, as the review of Ulster Bank uh, is undertaken. But it will provide us with an important opportunity to help shape the Ulster Bank. If it had been uh, taken out uh, of RBS, we would not have had that opportunity. Uh, most importantly, we need to uh, really advocate uh, for those 30 uh, per cent uh, of people in Northern Ireland who rely on the Ulster Bank for their finance. Uh, they are a, a very big player, the biggest player in Northern Ireland, and therefore uh, a strategically important part of growing the Northern Ireland economy. So we will continue to engage, particularly the Finance Minister, in relation to those issues. Sean Lynch. I will get the RS and I want to thank the Minister for answers. Can I ask or indicate what feed up feedback she has received from the business community with regards to the funding schemes introduced by the executive. Thank you. Well, the funding schemes introduced by the executive, particularly the growth loan fund, have been very warmly welcomed by the business sector. I don't actually have the up-to-date figures in front of me in relation to the take-up of that, but they have been uh, very strong. Uh, I'm also pleased to say that the uh, small loan fund that we've also launched has been taken up right across Northern Ireland. That's the one uh, that you can apply for anything from £1,000 to £50,000 on. That's working well as well. Um, the, the reason we brought these funds into being was uh, the very fact that uh, the national schemes didn't seem to be gaining traction here in Northern Ireland, and we felt that we had to intervene with very specific schemes. And it's also the reason why we've introduced the agri-food uh, loan scheme, uh, which he will know we hope will have a, a very positive impact on the poultry sector as the first phase. Uh, because we want to see the poultry sector growing very strongly. We believe there is a market opportunity uh, there, and uh, I hope that very many producers will be able to access finance with the help and assistance we have given from government. Dominic Bradley. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers. Uh, could I ask the Minister? Has she got any assurances from the Ulster Bank that they will continue to afford facilities to SMEs, facilities which sadly have been cut on many occasions during the last year, causing great pain and consternation to smaller businesses? And uh, that goes back to my response to Ms McLaughlin earlier on. I mean, I think that uh, we need to be vigilant as MLAs to raise issues with the banks when our constituents feel that they have been treated unfairly. And it's also one of the reasons why we have appointed uh, the independent panel under, as, a, as a recommendation from the Economic Advisory Group. Uh, the member may be aware that uh, the Finance Minister and myself have appointed this panel to have a look at how the uh, financial system works here in Northern Ireland, particularly in relation to access to finance for small and medium-sized companies. Uh, and that panel is Professor Russell Griggs, Anne McGregor and John Thrithowen. Uh, and two of those people are from outside of Northern Ireland but have very particular uh, expertise in the banking sector. And then, of course, Anne McGregor brings the Northern Ireland perspective uh, to the panel. So I'm hoping that that panel will take evidence, um, and indeed if MLAs feel that there's a need to bring evidence to them, I would encourage them to do that. 
uh, to see how the banking system is changing uh, and if indeed it has changed since the height of the recession, because we do need to see our banks being uh, flexible and working with the business community, particularly the small business community. Chris Little. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number three. Uh, my department continues to have regular formal meetings on security of energy supply with the Department of Energy and Climate Change in London and the Department of Communications, Energy and Natural Resources in Dublin and the energy industry through the UK, Ireland Gas and Emergency Planning Group. Additionally, the All-Ireland uh, Gas and Electricity Planning Group meets regularly to review resilience planning across the island and reports to the All-Ireland Energy Market State Joint Steering Group. There is also ongoing work between Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland on mutual fuel resilience. My department is represented on a number of DEC-led groups currently reviewing UK oil and fuel planning policy and emergency uh, arrangements. Little. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I thank the Minister for her answer. Can I ask the Minister uh, what more could be done, what alternative uh, provision of energy supply could be explored in order to promote more secure and affordable energy for businesses and households in Northern Ireland? Well, if I can say to the member, he has uh, maybe unwittingly put his finger on two of the most uh, contradictory part of this uh, element, uh, uh, secure and uh, affordable. And uh, sometimes the two don't always match up. And uh, you know that on the mainland there's a very uh, real debate going on at present in relation to green energy taxes. And the Prime Minister uh, is looking at that at the moment. And of course, I'll be watching that very closely to see what impact it has, if any, uh, on Northern Ireland. Because current levels of support for renewable energy, and we've been talking a lot in this House about the need to have a mix of energy resources and, as you know, we have a, a very stringent target in relation uh, to renewable energies, but if we are to see any cut in those incentives in relation to renewable uh, uh, energy, then that will have uh, an impact uh, in Northern Ireland. Of course, uh, one of the most critical pieces of infrastructure, the North-South Interconnector, is also very important for security of supply. And uh, it was actually a matter I had a discussion uh, with Minister Rabbit about uh, on Friday on the fringes of the North-South Ministerial Council. And he tells me that the current estimate in relation to the constraint uh, on uh, the system here on the island is £30 million per year. So that's a very critical uh, piece of infrastructure that we need to see progressing. Uh, and he tells me that in relation to the part in the Republic of Ireland, they're hoping to go back in to onboard Planala in, in the near future, uh, as in relation to our part, I think there's strategic environmental assessments going on uh, for the peace in Northern Ireland. So a critical piece of infrastructure. I recognise the sensitivities, obviously, from a local point of view. But if we don't have the North-South Interconnector, we are threatening our security of supply in a very real and tangible way. Gregory Campbell. Mr Campbell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, just further to that point, can the Minister outline the possible consequences given the very substantial Midlands Wind Farm project in the Irish Republic, uh, what consequences or implications it may have should it prove to be successful in generating significant energy? Well, the Midlands Wind Farm project is uh, a Republic of Ireland uh, onshore uh, wind facility um, which is connecting to Great Britain through their interconnector, their east-west interconnector, which of course is now in place. And when I was at uh, the conference of ESB recently, they were very proud of the fact that they had delivered this uh, east-west connector. And of course, uh, from a security of supply point of view, it has been uh, very important. But the Westminster Energy Bill provides for non-UK renewable generation uh, to receive support through a UK feed-in tariff. Uh, which means that the consumers in the UK are actually paying uh, for non-UK renewable energy. Uh, therefore, excess wind energy from the Republic of Ireland may in the future be traded uh, with Great Britain and contribute to the UK target for renewable energy and is a cheaper option uh, for them uh, than developing indigenous uh, renewable so sources. And I think that's a very strong um, statement to make, if I may say so, that they are actually bringing in renewable energy from uh, the Republic of Ireland. Now, we are represented on the Renewable Trading Steering Group. Uh, I think that's very important because what I don't want to see happening 
is that it has an impact uh, on our renewables incentives because, of course, the costs are socialised right across the United Kingdom, uh, and so our consumers will have to contribute to the costs. So it, it will have, and I mean, people may say, what has that got to do with Northern Ireland? But it will have an impact on us here in Northern Ireland because the costs are socialised right across uh, the United Kingdom. So it's something that we are obviously keeping an eye on. Boy. Cam Colia, can I thank the Minister for her uh, answers thus far? And can the Minister uh, tell us what efforts are being made to better inform the demand side of management of electricity and encourage consumers to use electricity at times of lower demand? Well, that is a very important point because, of course, we want to uh, increase the energy uh, efficiency right across Northern Ireland. Uh, we undertook uh, a campaign uh, across all different sorts of media uh, last year uh, to try and encourage people to switch off appliances uh, and to use them at appropriate times when perhaps the demand uh, was not as high. Uh, we will continue with that. That was carried out through the Interdepartmental Working Group, uh, which I chair. Uh, because energy efficiency is a critical part uh, of our energy policy, and we will want to ensure uh, that that uh, stays at the forefront of everyone's minds in relation to any discussion about energy policy. Mr. Allister. With Bally Lumford B required to cease production in 2015 and Karut required to reduce production by 50 per cent the next year, it is quite clear we are facing into a significant generating deficit in Northern Ireland. In those circumstances, why is there no urgency and focus on a new generating plant in Northern Ireland and indeed on stabilising and increasing the Scottish interconnector? Or is the impression that the Department is quite disconnected and complacent about these matters? Is that unfair? I know the member can't help himself but make a snide <laughs> comment, but really Northern Ireland will still have a 200 megawatt generation capacity surplus after the decommissioning of the 510 megawatts of capacity at Ballylumford after 2015 and further restrictions at Kilroots generating units uh, from the Industrial Emissions Directive. However, uh, there is increased risk to Northern Ireland of a capacity deficit after 2021. Uh, and of course, by 2021, the Moyle interconnector will be fully operational and the new north south interconnector should be commissioned. So, uh, we are working with Mutual Energy to make sure that we have a, a short to medium term uh, look at what is happening in relation to the east west connector. Uh, I'm also, obviously, pushing ahead. Uh, with NIE in relation to the north-south interconnector. And of course, the regulator continues to work with Sony uh, to establish the necessary security of supply margins from January uh, 2016, and that will inform the necessity and options uh, for the provision of additional generation capacity at the least possible cost. And this is an important point, Mr Speaker, the least possible cost, because cost is an important element to this. And if the member thinks I should just start up a new generating plant now, does he not think that that's going to have some cost implications in relation uh, to Northern Ireland and its consumers? That's always at the forefront of my mind. If I have to instruct in relation to new generation capacity, I will do so. Uh, but we are not there yet, and we are very much keeping a watching brief in relation to this matter. And one is certainly not complacent. Chris Hazard. Chris Shiver, Cahir, let her hold. Question four, please. I had a very good meeting with Jim Shannon MP and representatives of the Friends of Explorers Group on the 21st of October, where I confirmed that the Northern Ireland Tourist Board has provided over 1.8 million of financial support to explorers since 1991 for capital, marketing, and other schemes. In considering the future of explorers, there is a need to improve the commerciality of the project for it to succeed in the long term, either in the public or, or private ownership. And while there is currently no financial support available from NITB to help explorers, both the Tourist Board and Invest Northern Ireland are available to work with Ardsborough Council on marketing activity and business planning to increase the commerciality of the project. Chris Hoffman. Can call you and thank the Minister indeed for her answer. D does the Minister agree with me that um, any loss of explorers would represent a severe blow to the, not just the local tourist economy, but the local economy as a whole in the County Down region? And further afield. And with this in mind, is she committed to doing all that she can to ensure Explorers' future? 
I can say the member, the meeting with uh, the members from the Friends of Explorers was a very good one insofar as we were very frank with each other uh, about what needed to happen uh, to make Explorers a commercial entity and to take it forward into the future. Uh, we are awaiting, I think they have plans to look at different models and different plans and when those plans come to us I give them a commitment and I stand by the commitment that I would certainly look at it in as positive a way as I possibly could. So we look forward to engaging uh, with uh, the Friends of Explorers uh, and indeed with other executive colleagues in relation to this issue. Mr Speaker, thank you. Uh, I thank the Minister. Can, uh, may I ask her what instructions she's given her officials on foot of last week's uh, Assembly debate, which overwhelmingly endorsed the idea of Explorers as a regional facility uh, requiring executive support? Well, as I indicated to the previous question, I await uh, any uh, proposals in relation to the issue. I particularly await to see the commerciality of the proposals and the sustainability for the future, because I think any of us want to make sure that Explores uh, gets uh, the stay of execution lifted, but we want to see it lifted not to come back on another day. Uh, we want to make sure that any saving of explorers will make sure that it lasts into the future. And therefore, there is a need for it to be commercial and there is a need for it not to look at maintaining the status quo. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the Minister will be aware that uh, our local councils financially support many tourist uh, attractions throughout Northern Ireland. Can I ask the Minister if she was to give financial assistance to the likes of explorers? Would she also consider other tourist and leisure uh, uh, attractions for funding throughout Northern Ireland? And I think the member has put his finger on that uh, very well, um, because one of the issues, and indeed uh, I'll not name him, but one of the Belfast MLAs, of which there are many, so I don't think I'm pointing one of them out, said to me, if Explorers gets funding, does that mean that Belfast Zoo can come uh, and look for additional funding? Uh, because, of course, that is supported by uh, Belfast City Council. Look, the important thing here is that uh, if we are able to help and assist explorers, we will do so in a way that will make it commercially viable and sustainable into the future so that it does not have to keep relying on public funds into the longer term. Mr Speaker, and I am grateful to the Minister's uh, responses so far. Can the Minister give the House an assurance that if Friends of Explorers and Ardsborough Council come up with a commercially viable uh, proposition for Explorers, her department will not be slow, will not be behind the door to support uh, that with uh, some financial regional support? I have already said to the members of Friends of Explorers directly that I will be as positive as I can be uh, when they bring forward uh, any proposal, and I do hope that they are able to bring that proposal forward in the very near future. Michelle McElveen. Bye, Mr. Speaker. My department through the Northern Ireland Tours Board has undertaken significant work to secure major global events to Northern Ireland, including major sporting events. Indeed, the success of the Irish Open in 2012 and the winning uh, of the Giro d'Italia for 2014 are two examples which highlight the success to date. The overall aim of the events function is to support the promotion of major events in Northern Ireland, which have the potential to impact positively on the image of Northern Ireland, including world-class international events, which generate significant economic benefit through attracting tourists and international press coverage. I have recently approved NITB's new Tourism Events Strategy 2020, which has a key focus on the bidding for and securing of major global sporting and cultural events to Northern Ireland. NITB will be working with other key stakeholders, in particular the Arts Council of Northern Ireland and Sport NI, and I would encourage these organisations to play their role in this regard. Ms. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would just like to thank the Minister for her answer and congratulate her on how she is securing major sporting events and promoting Northern Ireland. But further to that, could I ask the Minister what assistance she is giving to the IRFU to support their bid to host the Rugby World Cup in 2023? I thank the Member uh, for those comments and I can confirm to her that both myself and the Minister for Culture, Arts and Leisure had a very positive meeting uh, with officials from Ulster Rugby and the IRFU. Uh, I think within this past six weeks that took place. We are very supportive of bringing this event uh, to the island of Ireland, but we want to make sure that certainly uh, for those of us who are Ulster rugby fans that we see a tangible benefit for the people of Northern Ireland uh, if we bring uh, this event to the island of Ireland. So that is a key element to make sure that we have 
uh, some of the major uh, matches uh, in Northern Ireland so that we can all enjoy the spectacle, and it would be a spectacle, of the World Cup. Yeah. That includes questions.